There's nothing like a travel week to make our minds think about all the things we've done during our travels. I don't know what it says about me as a person, but I have been maintaining a list of travel mistakes since we started traveling. And it seems like a great time today because we've got a variety of mistakes that we've made over the last a uh, year and a half or more of full-time travel. There have been mistakes that we've made before that, <laughs> but I feel like these actually have been um, some of our worst mistakes regardless. Yeah, and in the moment, mistakes always feel like they're horrible. And sometimes when you look back on them, you can laugh. Sometimes you can't. <laughs> We want to share with you some of our mistakes because what we think is that even though we've made mistakes, they've made us much better travelers. So I don't regret <laughs> any of the mistakes I've made because we've learned so much. I kind of regret them. <laughs> I'd rather not have made a few of them because they cost money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree, but I feel like sometimes you learn best by making the mistakes, but hopefully you are someone who can learn from others. <laughs> that would be us. I'm Judy. And I'm Kevin. Welcome back to Finding Jeannie Marie, where we share our lives as full-time travelers and the connections we make along the way. So we're gonna talk about our mistakes from our least serious to our most serious. And we'll start off with one that is categorized as a senior moment. This first mistake is from Japan. And we arrived there, we started out in Tokyo, we moved to Kyoto and various other places. And then after a month or so, our daughter ended up joining us for the last eight days. She was pretty much in charge of all of the planning for this eight days because she had a list of things she wanted to see, which was fine. We'd already spent most of our time uh, doing everything that we wanted to do. So it was no problem. During the last day of sightseeing, I had mentioned that I really wanted to fit in Sensoji Temple. And we weren't quite sure how we were going to be able to make this work. And I think I would, was probably bringing it up the entire time we were in Tokyo, that I really want to do this, I really want to do this. But time just wasn't working out. Finally, we squeeze it in. And of course we do all of the things that you do when you go to a temple. We went and ate a bunch of different foods at the food court area that they had. And we walked around, we took pictures, we climbed up into the temple and suddenly. <laughs> As we're taking pictures, like looking around going, okay, this is beautiful. I'm really glad we came here. This, is, this has been so much, there's so much activity. There's so many people at the food booth. This is just wonderful. And then I'm taking a photo of the ceiling. It's like, that ceiling's bare. It's like, it's missing something. Like, like that temple we saw with the missing dragon in the top. Yeah, we had read about the fact that the Senzoji temple has a dragon you should see, but you can't see it right now because it fell, it fell off the wall and or off the ceiling. So we then have this moment of realization that we'd oh. actually been here during the first four days that we were in Japan. And of course, we're looking at each other like, do we tell Megan? Do we, do we let her know that this is our second time to this temple? What temple is this? Because I'm Sensoji. Sensoji. In Tokyo. In Tokyo, which we've been- The oldest temple in Japan. <laughs> it's so old, we had to come twice. Because we're so old that we forgot that we came here a month ago when we first got to Japan. So, but you, we're here with our daughter, which yeah. we weren't the first time. It's a totally different vibe while it's busy, and it was a lot less busy when we were here before. Yeah. And on our way here, we stopped at a really cool restaurant. Well, we didn't know what to do uh, when we were here the first time. There's so many booths and everything else. Now that we've been to so many temples, that actually was better the second time. We, we got more out of it. So. Right, and and our daughter has had all of this background information and all the cool little vendors to be eating at. So we've also been eating along the way yeah. at some places that we never would have heard at. So second time, best time. <laughs> of course, Megan thought we were completely insane. It's like, really, you begged me for this? You begged me to get to this temple and you've been here already? It's better this time and you enjoyed it, right? You were loving all the food. So not such a serious problem, but 
in the grand scheme of things. Still. Yeah. It's one thing when you intend to go twice. Yeah. It's another and you don't. All right. A second mistake falls under the category of maybe we're just a little bit too nice. I feel like it's one of those things that you know better and you allow it to happen <laughs> anyway. We were in Egypt and we made actually a few mistakes in Egypt, yeah. um, still under the category of we were too nice. Right. Uh, but we were on our way to the Egyptian museum and we ran into somebody. It, it was a confusing intersection because there's multiple ways you could go. And this person walk, was walking um, and basically said, uh, you know, where, where are you, you from? Yeah. Where are you from? Yeah. Well, trying to make small talk. Right. And we were reasonably polite. And then he mentioned the fact that, uh, oh, you know, this is probably not the best time to go to the Egyptian museum because it's going to be lunchtime. It's going to be really crowded. It would probably be a better idea for you go for you to take a look at this neighborhood, which is supposed to be beautiful. And, you know, OK, sure. We're appreciative of the advice. Yeah. And he was saying that let me show you a better way of getting to the Egyptian museum, because if you go on these streets, it's harder. There's a way to go under and you want to deal with traffic. It's like great, great sounds the way it sounds nice. We love touring cities anyway. So we're starting to walk to the area he wants to go to. He said, my art studio is in that same area. So I'll, I'll just go with you, you know. So we're walking along. And then he said, yeah, my studio is right here. And I was like, oh, we love art. Well, yeah. let's go in. So we well, go. He invited us in, he, but well, yeah, we were right. all, all on board thinking, oh, this is exciting. We'll we'll be happy to see it. We'll take photos. We'll put it on YouTube. We'll help this, this very starving artist. Person. <laughs> yeah. And we'll we'll also get some good culture. So it'd be great. Well, we got in there and it's uh, papyrus Pap art. Painting on papyrus is a thing that you see a lot when you're doing tours in Egypt. And of course, when we get in there, like, oh, OK, not the studio we thought it was going to be. So we kind of knew right away something was going on. Then there's always an offer of a courtesy. They'll give you hot tea. So they give you the courtesy and it's like being nice. We said, OK, sure, we'll have some tea. We didn't even sit down and he had taken out a small papyrus and said, oh, well, let me put your name on it. This will just be my gift to you. We're sitting there with the tea. We've got apparently our little personalized papyrus and it was our gift. And so it was the tea, nothing, nothing of charge here, you know. So then he starts talking about his different types of art and how he's doing, doing different papyrus art. We're like, all right, here we go. Right. We, as full-time travelers, we don't ever buy souvenirs. No, we have no room for it. Even, even a rolled up little piece of papyrus. Before we know it, he's showing us these different pieces, but he's putting them kind all of over the floor, yeah. on the floor, blocking Kevin in. And so we're looking at them and he's asking, like, which are your favorites? Choose two. And then he's looking at more. And before we know it, it's like, all right, well, thank you very much. But we are not interested in any of these papyruses. He did not want us to leave without buying something. So he's trying to upsell us to something else. And we could have just walked out. I mean, you you're not blocked in so much that you can't step over these, but they purposefully make it very uncomfortable for you to walk out. And we just said, OK, how much for one of these, you know, and then he starts talking prices. And and then I offered him a very low price because you're supposed to negotiate in Egypt. And I'm, I'm well, and, we were, and, and really, the idea was this is just courtesy money. We're yeah, we're just, we're just throwing some money at you just to be nice. Of course, we're so nice that I kept letting him bump the price up. And... Well, no, his attitude was this is worth way more than that. Yeah. And so... Long story short, we end up with a $35, $40 papyrus, which is outrageous. Yeah, it should be like $2 at the most. Uh, well, I don't know. It, it could have been le a legitimate papyrus. Oftentimes, they're not. They're on banana leaves, and we didn't pay enough attention to know which was authentic. No, we're but, just trying to get out of there at that point. Right. At that point, we just... It was fine. I think it cost us around 1,200 Egyptian pounds. We donated to the local culture. <laughs> and we learned a valuable lesson. Yeah. I was at least appeased to know that one of my favorite travelers who has traveled all over the world made a similar mistake um, in an alabaster shop. <laughs> so it can happen to the best of us. Mistake number three is what we're calling pressing submit before thoroughly looking at the details when booking a flight mistake. 
So I was reviewing our flight list and what we were missing. And we had a couple flights that were not on our list that were booked. So I went in, booked the first flight. I went through eDreams, did their normal process of going through the steps. They changed a few things. So I noticed that when I was booking the flight, that it had a new prompt for middle name in the screen. Now I, I saved both of our details. So I was curious why there was no middle name in either of those. So I put a middle name on that form. Being the careful person I am, I want to make sure I don't miss any details. Went through the process, booked everything, was a little annoyed after I got done with it because I didn't get uh, the discount that I normally get as an eDreams Prime member. So when I got done with that, I contacted them, said, where's my discount? What's going on here? The next day, I was going through the flight list and said, okay, yeah, I got to book this other one. I had a little hard time finding a flight that was the right price. There was a lot of booked up flights. So I finally found one with good price. There was a four or five seats left. So I was like rushing to get this flight done, putting the information in, going through the whole process. Again, annoyed that middle names are missing. So I go ahead and put those in. Look at the ticket before I actually click submit and notice I wasn't getting my discount again. But I was a little panicked anyway and said, you know, I really can't afford to lose this flight because I don't know if we can get another one. And this is getting late and these flights are obviously booked up. So I hit submit. And I said, I've got 24 hours. I can just fix this. So I went through the process and contacted you, eDreams. Again, I said, I got two flights now that didn't have any discount on them. One uh, a little over a day ago and one today. And they come, came back and said, oh, your name is wrong on your ticket. I said, what do you mean my name is wrong? Kevin Michael Hopter. I said, no, look at it. It's Kevin Michael Michael Hopter. Judith Louise Hopter, your wife's is fine, but your name has a double middle name on it. I went, well, then why is the form sitting there asking for a middle name if you're not going to... Anyway, okay, so fine. Can you fix it? And they said, well, we can't fix the first one. You have to contact the airlines. Um, and the second one, uh, you can either cancel it or you can contact the airlines and just get the name changed. Well, I didn't want to cancel it because I didn't want to lose this flight. So, in retrospect, I should just cancel it, but I can't go back and change things. So I said, well, let me just contact the airlines. Unfortunately, a lot of these airlines in Southeast Asia don't have easy ways to contact them. And this was one of the worst. It was only email. So I'm panicking, sending them an email, urgent, urgent. I need to get someone to contact me back waiting all evening, trying to get this fixed before the 24 hours is over. They contact me the next day, probably still within the 24 hours, and they said they can fix the name. I said, fine, fine, let's fix the name then. So they went through the process and fixed the name and charged me a small fee. Like, okay, that's fine. It's, it's, the, the price for it was in Thai bot, and it was pretty cheap when I actually did the math. It's like, it's under 10 bucks. It's 15 bucks at the most. So then I went back and looked at the first flight that I had booked, and it turns out to be a name change charge of at least $60, 58 euros. I said, okay, well, that's a little pricey. Plus, I still didn't get my discounts on these flights. So now I'm wasting a few hundred dollars, not just 60 or $70. It's, it's getting up there. So then I went through the whole process, got them to change it, got both airlines to change it. And then I went back to eDreams and said, okay, my name's right on both of them. Can I retroactively get the discounts? So they went, oh, no, that's not going to happen at this point. Should have canceled the flights. Like, all right, fine. So now I'm deep into a couple hundred dollars or more of missing discounts, change fees, uh, days of hassling with these airlines, going back and forth via email, which is not the way I like to do things. I like to just contact someone, get it fixed, and be done with it. So if I had just in that moment has seen that the name was obviously wrong on the information on the summary, I shouldn't have hit submit. And so double check, triple check, and maybe don't panic about a flight getting lost because you think you need to get this push in right now. <laughs> but lesson learned, I, I, I know better now and I, and I know exactly why this happened. I will not do it in the future. Both our names are saved properly in our systems. With middle names, I will never add another middle name. This number two mistake we're calling just read a map.
<laughs> and also <laughs> lay out your plan before it's too late. In full detail, check everything on this list. So our first year of travel, I'm going to give ourselves a little bit of grace. One of the places Kevin really wanted to experience was the Glacier Express, which is an eight hour train ride. And you could take a shorter amount of time, but we decided we wanted to do the whole thing. Yeah, it's a photography masterpiece. Like you get so much good videos. It's will be great for the channel. We'll have so much good content. It'll just be beautiful. What an experience. It takes you from Zermatt all the way to St. Moritz. They have shorter versions of it. We chose Let's do the whole thing. We don't know anything about this. It's our first time. It's a little complicated to book that travel, though. You can only book it three months in advance. So we didn't really book any travel to our follow on destinations until we're here doing this. And we realize, OK, time's now getting short and we really need to start booking trains. And then I look at the trains going, OK, we have an option for a sleeper train. So apparently this is a an overnight train. Maybe it's a little slower. I didn't look that bad. It's only about six and a half, seven hours. We've done longer trains than that. We don't need a sleeper. Why, why would we spend 200 more dollars to get a sleeper? We could just sit in a seat. It's fine. So we decided against that. I looked at other options saying, could we fly? Well, we had to take a train to another city just to get a flight out. And the flights were expensive also, even more expensive than the upgrade on the train. So I said, that's silly. Let's just go train. We do trains really well. What we didn't realize is that we are going to spend 11 days in Krakow and then a month in Vienna. But that's not the way <laughs> trains travel <laughs> or maps work. I don't know how that kind of missed my brain, but I was thinking, OK, there's got to be other options to get to Krakow. It's like, no, no, the option is to go to Vienna. And then you wait in Vienna for a few hours and then you go to Krakow. It's like, seriously, that's our only option. And we really try that. But it's late now, so we've already got everything else, but we can't change anything. Our, our Airbnbs were locked in. We didn't have any choices. And also, we were only going to be in Krakow for 11 days. So we didn't want to lose any more time to travel than we absolutely had to without having to pay for an expensive flight, which we weren't willing to do. Yeah. And this all would have been a little bit less painful if we had known how much time that whole Glacier Express and then retracing of some of those paths of the Glacier Express to get to our hotel to stay overnight before all this other train travel was going to wear on us. It was a lot of hours. It was a very long day. It ended up being um, in total because we were before the Glacier Express, we were coming from Torino, Italy. So we ended up having uh, 36.5 hours on trains over the course of four days. And that is a little bit of wait time in train stations, in between trains. And it also included backtracking from the Glacier Express to um, Bukes yeah. so that we could then begin the routing to Vienna, to Krakow. Yeah. The day we thought was exhausting was nowhere near the next couple days of train rides. So after Glacier Express, we're in St. Moritz and we have to get trains back to Bukes so we could actually get on the next trains for the next day. And as we're waiting for this train, as we're sitting on this train, getting ready to go, realizing we're going to see some of the same sights we just saw over the previous eight or so hours, it's like, ah, this is exhausting. It was fun until it wasn't fun. So it's been a long day of trains. How are you doing about all that? It's fine. I just feel like we've taken trains and then taken trains back to where we were. And yeah, probably the plan better, but we learned this train system in Switzerland really well. <laughs> I was feeling myself that there are sometimes hiccups that come up, but in the grand scheme of things, having to you know, repeat a path for two hours yeah. is like such a small thing for yeah, everything we did today. And the Swiss Alps. You know. <laughs> Worst place to repeat things. Yes. Agreed. So that was that was the first moment of, oh, OK, what did we do to ourselves? And of course, whatever, you can't change at that point. And then we got to the hotel, woke up the next morning. We're getting ready to go on these two trains and we take the first one and it was fine. The, the train to Vienna actually wasn't that bad. 
Uh, we made a mistake. And well, then... well, the issue was it didn't depart until two o'clock. So we just kind of had to hang out and oh, it was right. pouring rain. So we had to walk around with suitcases and try not to get wet. And we, we leave at two, which means that we're going to arrive in Vienna at 10 p.m. Yeah. And this train ride, we made a mistake on it because we didn't actually buy seat reservations. We only bought the tickets. Again, not thinking that this is, oh, the German train system requires two purchases. The purchase of a train ticket and then also a seat reservation. Right. So we were actually on the train when we realized before yeah. the conductor came that we needed to quick get online and purchase seat tickets. So we did that. Okay, that was enough chaos for that flight, that, that train. So we sat down the train, did that train ride. As Judy said, we got in late, 1030 at night. So we had three hours to think about our mistakes. Think about what we've done. We're sitting in Vienna, a city that we're going to real soon now, like two weeks from now. Less than two. Less than two weeks. weeks. We could have just been here. We could have been done with the trains. By this point, we're exhausted of trains. We love trains and we were done with trains. So this is the crazy situation. For well, us. it's just, I think, frustrating that you know that there's a more... Kevin, Kevin's an engineer. <laughs> and when you know that there's a more efficient way and you don't do it, it is really frustrating. And we knew that we were making all kinds of mistakes. Our last aha moment was when we got on this train to go to Krakow. And we thought, why is it so important to get a sleeper on an overnight train? We've been on a train for nine hours in Italy, and we just sat in the seats and we're comfortable. Turns out it's either a sleeper or you go into these car boxes that have six seats in them. And not just six seats, three and three, where your knees are bumped up against the person in front of you and you're staring at them this whole time. When you're trying to sleep, it's very creepy. <laughs> so what'd you think of our uh, six-seater here? It was not the easiest train we've ever been on. Yeah. And it definitely wasn't luxury to be in this environment. But yeah, this is tight. And also, they kept waking us at every uh, stop along the way to check our tickets to make sure we weren't supposed to be off the train. So there was no rest. It was very uncomfortable. It was very awkward. The people that would get on and get off of this car, luckily it wasn't six people at any point, but it still was pretty tough with three or four of us on there. Yeah, because actually the seats we were supposed to have, somebody else took and yeah. the conductor said, just go do it. This, from this is any, go to, yeah. Um, the, the, the win of it was that our Airbnb Krakow allowed us to check in early. So yeah. we checked in at 7 a.m., which was really nice. and. We didn't have to pay extra for that. Yeah. Looking back on it, we could have made this such an efficient trip. We could have done a shorter Glacier Express. We could have taken fewer train rides to begin with. We might have taken a flight if I had known that this was the only train option to get from Vienna to Krakow. And our top mistake isn't just a money issue or an embarrassment issue or a senior moment. It could have been real trouble for our travels in the future. This mistake is on me. I'm the one of us who books the visas when we're traveling to countries that require them. And we were going back to Vietnam. So I had experience with booking a visa, knew the website, knew to double check things. And I just didn't. <laughs> so we well, did. <laughs> well, the first mistake was that I knew we had some time and I'd already had experience. I knew it took three days. I knew I needed to give myself more time than that, but I didn't plan for Tet. And that meant that uh, Vietnam's government offices were closed for 10 days. And that meant that even when I submitted my visa, it took longer than three days after the 10 days to get the visa returned. And I made a mistake on my visa and had us had me returning a day too early. So we were going to be in v in Vietnam for 21 days, and I booked from the start of the trip to the end of the trip. Even though technically you have 30 days, yeah. they don't require you to upload your accommodations or anything like that, at least not for Americans. And so I didn't. I just had the itinerary. She was being precise. You I was know, just trying to do here. We're arriving this day. We're leaving that day. That's all we need. The lesson learned is give yourself the full 30 days. Just ask for a visa for 30 days and it'll make your life so much easier. Or just a buffer in case something happens. You know, sometimes flights get canceled and you cannot stay past a visa. So 
I realized it before we left, but I was a little unsure that because of the backlog that we would get it back in time. So I just left it. And my plan was to deal with it in Vietnam. But when we arrived, I was intimidated. And they I saw that the stamp that they gave me actually had the date on it written down. So there was not going to be any negotiating. There was an immigration office right there at the airport. So I could have resolved it when we first arrived. Yeah, that would have been the perfect timing for it. And we would have had a more relaxing trip. Instead, I said, uh, you know, I'll go online, I'll research it, I'll understand exactly what I need to do, and we'll be prepared. Well, we were really, really busy in Hoi An, and so it wasn't as much of a priority, because I knew I had three weeks to resolve it. And I checked online, and people were saying, oh, you know, you could just go to an immigration office, or actually a police station yeah. would be able to handle it. So we scoped out the police station, and then we went back a few days later, and... They said, no, we don't handle these here. Yeah. Go to the other office. Yeah. So um, so we went to the other office and unfortunately they were closed. Well, there was a holiday and then the next day we tried to go, they had meetings. So we, two more days have elapsed. I'd, I'd contacted our Airbnb host and said, are you familiar with what to do? Because a lot of people have said, you know, there's people, there's ways of getting around all of this and... You know, somebody can handle it for you. No, he really didn't have any resources. So we were pretty worried. We wasted all of this time going back and forth to all of these various places, trying to get it resolved. And at the last place, I said, can you not give me some letter that I tried to resolve yeah. this early? <laughs> we're in the immigration office trying to fix this. They, nope, we, only, we don't fix e-visas. We only fix uh, physical visas. So... We can't do anything. We can't write anything down for you. You just have to go to the airport and deal with it there. Throughout this whole process, I checked to see if I could get an e-visa online. No. When you're in country, your options are really limited. You know, we were leaving Vietnam for the second time. We know, knew we weren't coming back for at least another year. And we try to use up as much of the currency as we can. And so we were... We, we were approached by our Airbnb saying, we'll save you some money if you want to use us and we'll take you to the airport. Yeah. So we said, okay, yes, that sounds great. Do you accept credit cards? And they said, yes. So we thought, great, we have enough money to pay this fine and also to get ourselves to the airport. We won't have to pay cash for that. Yeah. And then I'm trying to book, pay for this on our before we leave. And it turns out, well... It's just not working. Their credit card machine was not working. They were having problems with the internet. Whatever it was, I ended up having to pay cash for this drive. Instead of going through Grab or anything else, we're kind of committed to this now. So the extra money that I had now is gone. We had a little bit of money. If it would have cost $22 US dollars a day, we, we would have been, been fine. Yeah. Yes, we had a little bit more than that. But um, I talked to the agent and it, there was a lot of back and forth. And eventually we ended up, everything worked out. It cost $55 though. And, There's a penalty on top of there. Whether it's a yeah, penalty uh, or whatever it was, it was more than the $22. But it was enough that I had to go find an ATM machine. The first one in the airport was broke. Had to walk through to another. So it added to all this tension and stress of travel days, which are already enough of attention and stress for us. I I generally don't mind travel days, but there's certainly a lot of things you want all to work together. Yeah. The airport in general ended up being a very complicated process. And at the end of it, he did not give me any kind of an overstay stamp. He canceled the old visa, gave me a new visa. It was fine. It worked out. But it was frustrating and it could have ended much differently. Yeah. And it was one of those situations where it's not just paying a little extra money. That wasn't the problem. We just didn't want to do anything to sacrifice or compromise any travel in the future. So that's why it was so serious. Right. We didn't want to not be able to get into Vietnam again, but we also didn't want anybody else at airport passport control yeah. to be looking at our um, at our passport and see a problem that we would overstay somewhere else. We don't want something on our permanent record. <laughs> And maybe we are worrying unnecessarily, but I would always suggest that you worry a little bit more than a not enough. We're rule followers. Like we, don't, we don't like to break the rules.
for as embarrassing as it is for us to share these mistakes with you, we hope that you learned something from it. And if you did, we hope you'll share this episode with your friends and family. Uh, give us a like, subscribe if you haven't already. Check out FindingGenuary.com. Judy has a lot of articles, especially about that train ride. So check that out and our community forum. Until next time. Until next time.